Daniel Duaron, you're welcome again to Agility Chefs. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. It's early in the morning here in Montreal, but uh, and snowing. Oh, I'm ready. <coughs> Good stuff. Uh, Daniel, uh, you've been on the show a few times. We've talked yes. a lot about Tame Flow, and you wrote a book uh, with Steve Tendon, uh, Tame Your Workflow, which is up yes. in the top right corner. Uh, yes. For those people who haven't, uh, who haven't seen that book yet, there is a book offer. Um, so if you want to get a discount on the book, the book is expensive. Uh, it's about 90 quid or something like that. And uh, you can get it for more or less half price, I think, with this offer. Um, so check that out. Um, these offers usually only happen during these shows are uh, the, uh, what's the, what's you call them? The Campfire or Herbie as well. I believe you do discounts on those ones as well. So Daniel, you, uh, you uh, wanted to talk about a few flawed mental models today i believe and uh audio problems no problem so while while daniel's getting sorted out i just want to show you my new toy i have a new toy and it's to it tells me you know how many people are I'm sorry john i'm having audio problems no problem so i'm just explaining something to the viewers i have a new toy and uh, it rings a bell every time someone follows me on YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. So I'm looking forward to hearing the bell ringing during the show. I hope you're going to uh, get this bell, ring bell ringing for me, okay? Just a bit of fun, just add a bit of amusement, amuse me uh, while we're listening to Daniel, okay? So Daniel, is your audio sorted now? Yes, it is. Good, good. It's good to have a plan B. So Daniel, um, your show today is about flawed mental models. Yes. And cognitive biases. Um, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, well, uh, many, many times people talk on, about anti-patterns and uh, flawed. I think they are also uh, akin to uh, cognitive biases and, of course, uh, flawed mental models. And I gathered a lot of, uh, a lot of things that I've... Uh, my interest over the last couple of years and uh, I read a book and uh, sorry about that and about uh, it was a very long time ago okay it's a uh, popular delusions and the madness of crowds okay, I don't know can you see it there um, I don't see it no but um... That's okay. We can, we can I can do a search while you're talking and then bring that book up and share the link with people. Not a problem. Okay. Let me share a new. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing any share, uh, Daniel. It's better. We just move on because it's just going to cause delay. Um, so can you tell us about uh, some of these models? Because you had quite a list. I saw on the on the uh oh you're showing something now okay yeah you, let me go okay. with powerpoint it'll be much easier for me okay Off okay go. so basically let me get to my page here basically the book that i read many many years ago on popular delusions and the the madness of crowds um basically introduced me to a lot of things that uh, people take for granted and basically turn up to be false. Uh, flood mantle models are one example of such. And uh, one of the examples that was in the book was basically uh, in the time where uh, tulips were in fashion in uh, Holland at the time. And the prices was going up and people were buying them like crazy. And at some point, uh, some poor guy uh, went into a rich people's house and took a tulip, a, a bulb and ate it. And it was like worth uh, thousands of dollars and he was in prison for, for doing so. And uh, two months later, when the price of the bulbs went down to ridiculous prices, well, he was still in jail and uh, they had to pretty much get him out of there because he stole nothing, basically. There are other things that are self-evident, but not obvious. 
And I don't know if you know the uh, the story of the egg of Columbus. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, so basically Columbus, because it, before he set out for the Indies, uh, where he eventually turned out to discover uh, America, he said he was being refused. So he said, hey, I bet you anything, a wager, friend wager, if I can't put this egg standing up on the table without any intervention, well, you send me to uh, to the Indies. And he said, sure, hey, why not? So he took the egg, he shook it, and this inside the egg make it such that the egg can stand on its own. So off he was to uh, the Indies. Basically, there are a lot of things that of course, once you know this for life, you can trick everybody after that, you know, so to speak, if you have a friendly wager. Mm -hmm. They're not self, they are self-evident, but not obvious. And this brings me to uh, uh, the, the way the contribution that TimeFlow makes is that we, we reverse these anti-patterns, these uh, cognitive biases, and do you know the Mercedes brands of cars, uh, John? Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the AMG is kind of fancy version, isn't it? Yeah. But one of my friend had a Golf, 144 horsepower, and he got a Golf R, the racing Golf, 288 horsepower, same car. This just changed the chip in the engine. And I think that AMG, I'm pretty sure I could be corrected, but I think that this is what they do. What they do. And this is what is needed, the analogy, to change our flawed mental models. Uh, throughout the uh, discussions that we're going to have today, I, I will put some quotes that are you know, pertinent to the topic that we'll discuss. Mm -hmm. And my quote of the year for 2020 is from Jim Benson uh, of Personal Kanban. I love this quote. He says, time does not fit it flows and it has a lot of uh, meaning into the next topics that we might cover uh, during the presentation. What, what do you think about this, uh, this quote, uh, John? I really like this. Yeah. I think it's, I think it's pretty neat. Yeah. And the other thing also that I want to, you know, to say before we start is all models are wrong, but some are, are, useful it's the same every anything that i can say can be like a bit controversial but hey everything's wrong even what i say is wrong and even what you might be doing is wrong and what i may be doing maybe doing in the future could be wrong so the first topic that i love is capacity capacity see no evil speak no evil and hear no evil evil why because we tend to neglect capacity and not to see the value that is in it. And something that uh, people like to talk about is that, oh, this absorbs variability, this absorbs variability, but protective capacity and excess capacity absorbs variability as well. And let's see this uh, standard board here, where we see analysis, dev, test, and UAT. Yeah. And in order for us to pick uh, where the uh, constraint is, the amount that the face that has the lowest amount of capacity, it would be test because this is where the average flow time is at its highest, right? So yeah. test is the constraint of the system. Uh, analysis, a ticket and analysis spends two days, a ticket and dev one day, ticket and text three, constraint and UAT one. Okay, so now I'm gonna put, I'm, I'm gonna put a little trick on you guys. Okay, you see this capacity here? I'm gonna put it under a geographic uh, form with uh, with figures, with uh, squares and rectangle rectangles. So C is the lowest, A is the next lowest, and B and D are you know the the places where there are most capacity in the system. Okay, so so far so good, John. So are you saying that B and D have the most capacity in the system? Yeah, B and D are really are the places where you have the most capacity. C has the least capacity and A has the next to least capacity or next to most capacity. You see, yeah. I, yeah. I've done the transposition from the average flow time 
two geographic, uh, geometrical uh, representation of them. Okay, so C has the average longest flow time with three, and it has therefore the least capacity with C. So C has the smallest square, if you want. Yeah. B and D have the biggest amount of capacity because this is where the ticket spends the least amount of time. Yeah. So they have the biggest capacity. And A is sort of in the middle with two days. I want to do this because the next transformation in order for, uh, for learning purposes uh, will require this. Can I just pause you there for a second? This rings a bell for me because some of the teams I'm working with at the moment they have their own Kanban board, okay? Each each team is their own board. But they send off the work to a third-party company. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And so when, when you look at the flow analytics, the cycle times are going up. The aging is going off the scales. Yeah. But when I talk to people individually, they're saying, I feel like I've got capacity because they send it off to that company. They're waiting two weeks for it to come back, and there's toing and froing and all that kind of stuff. So in that case, the third-party company is probably the constraint. And and so the people who are handing that work off to that other company feel like they've got capacity, but actually the whole system doesn't really have capacity. Is that what is that what you're kind of saying? Well, the whole system says that the uh, the places where the average flow time is the highest, whether you do it internally or send it up externally, yeah, is where the constraint is. Okay. Yeah. Now, if because of that people have more slack. It means that they have excess capacity that can go to either A, B, and D. Yeah. Because okay? while while they're waiting, they're idle. Yeah. And idleness is good because it reflects excess capacity, which yeah. from which presumably will be able to go to A, B, and D. But that's a very, very, very good question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So now we're only gonna <clears throat> we're only gonna go with the it's morning era for me, so it's my morning morning voice. Not that my afternoon voice is any better, but <laughs> yes, so we see here that C is the constraint because it has the longest average flow time to go through the system. Mm -hmm. And now what is what is the trick here that's being laid in front of your eyes? Is that if you were only to manage the constraint, only to manage C, you can manage the entire system. Because mm -hmm. nothing's going to go faster than the constraint. Agreed. But if you want to play the hero and not be aware of your constraint, well, you're going to have to manage everything. And you're going to go from left to right to middle and say, oh, man, I'm working so hard. I see no results. What's wrong with me? But somebody who knows where the constraint is, is basically going to say, hey, man, concentrating on a constraint. And the rest of the follow has no choice but to follow because it can't go any faster anyway. So you got a choice, you manage A, B, C, and D, or you manage C, and you get stellar results. Got it. Yeah, now, now the, the, the danger of that is that when an accountant is going to see this, that you have excess capacity, or someone in lean, they're going to say, oh, no, and everything above the productive capacity that is needed for C is going to have to be cut. So they're going to cut. And they're going to think that in doing so, especially lean people, they say, oh, we're balancing flow. But balancing flow is not done by balancing capacity. Flow issues are self-revealing with in a low whip system. Mm -hmm. okay? That's where the it's, lean guys would agree with you, though, wouldn't they? when you lower the water, you can see yes. the rocks, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, well, well, you see, that's the thing. The lean people would agree with this, but the lean people would also cut capacity, yeah. which is... Uh, which is strange, actually. It's a good thing that you bring it up. Mm. Uh, and we'll see why we need uh, excess capacity in, in, in a second. But okay. that, that's a very good point. Lean, Lean would agree to to, <laughs> to that part of the system on the right. I, I, I didn't make the connection. Thank you. Thank you, John. Okay. So you've got three types of capacity. But in the way that we work, that, that's a type of capacity, layers of capacity, capacity that we talk of in the theory of constraint. You got productive capacity to meet demand. 
Then you got protective capacity to keep the constraint busy because the constraint can never go idle. Never, never, because you lose money. Mm. And then you got excess capacity on top and above of everything. Okay. And these three qualifiers of capacity are never used in our day to day language as agilists, you know. Uh, and, and, and it would be important to start understanding the difference. Because if you want idle workers, you've got to have to have protective and excess capacity and engineering in such a way uh, that you know where to put it. Um, I just have a comment there from Andre. He's a regular on the show. Yeah. And uh, he's saying it's clear from the picture, but it's complex. I think it's, in, it's I think he's trying to say complexity, not comprehensive or managing many times. I don't fully understand your point, Andre. If you... Um, can you make out what that means, um, Daniel? It's clear from the picture, but it's complexity, not not sure what that okay. means. Um, I'm not sure, but listen. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell you, okay? Yeah. If you've got a board or anything, okay, you can calculate the average flow time that everything spends in there. Yeah. Yes, we've seen this. A ticket on yeah. average spends two day and eight, spends yeah. one day and B. Yeah. Uh, spends one day in test and spends one day in new AT. Mm -hmm. Where's the constraint? The constraint is where the ticket spends the most amount of time because this is where there is less constraint for it to be treated. Yeah. And from there on, you have it. I'm just making uh, geometrical uh, transformation on that top because it's easier for me then. Yeah to get to that type of, of, of drawing, okay? Yeah, yeah. And Andrew's actually agreeing. He's come back and he's saying managers are struggling to understand this. And I, well, I yeah, that. man, I'm telling you, we run by, we run by accountants, eh? So, uh, so no, you see, I got my protect, productive capacity, protective capacity, and excess capacity. Yeah. And if I put, again, my constraint, you see, I yeah. see that my productive capacity is just enough for C, and this is perfect. You know, this is perfect. Yeah. Now A, B, and and A, B, and D have to have excess capacity. It's required for a for a performing organization, and they go and they use protective capacity, and they go and they use excessive capacity. Productive and excessive capacity have to exist. They have to be there. They must be there. But we don't. We can't even spell protective capacity and excess capacity. Can I just pause you for a second? So, yeah. when you say protective capacity, is that like for the unexpected? And is excess protective capacity? capacity? Okay, yeah. I'm, right. you, you, you're a, you're a, you're ahead one step. So, of me. I'm and sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm yeah. doing. And I'm yeah. answering your question yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, listen. Uh, remember the talk that we had on throughput accounting. Yeah. A while ago. Well, the thing is, and maybe I'll answer your question indirectly, is everybody that's not at the constraint C has to have excess capacity for the system to function. Let yeah. me let me show you how. You know, I'll, I'll tell you places where you can have excess capacity and where you should not have excess capacity or protective capacity based on the on, on throughput accounting. <clears throat> Um, business analysis, business requirements, and architectures. You know what Donald Reinenson refers to as the fuzzy front end? Yeah. <clears throat> Man, do I want excess capacity there? <laughs> you know, because this is where the war is won or lost. You, you agree with me? Yeah. Now, let's say that analysis is on A. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Everybody else in the organization would have to have excess capacity on top and above of A. Yeah. Okay? I don't want that. I don't want the constraint to be A because A is going to require a lot of resources and then all of the other parts of the system will require a lot of resources. So I don't want A to be the constraint, but I want A to have a lot of excess capacity so that it can feed my constraint, which is at C. Yeah, because we would, we don't want the constraint to starve, basically. Yes. And so, yeah. Yes, and yeah, that that's that's one phrase that is totally logic. Now, yeah, 
let's say that I'm uh, so 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 that's for uh, and, but the real reason in terms of uh, throughput accounting would be that because a you know the the analysis people the requirements analysis people there is a lot of complexity operationally to get this right you know it's not a place where you like complex operational complexity to be at your constraint mm -hmm. it's not the place where you want it yeah the other place where you would want uh, your constraints to be is where throughput is most directly linked to that phase of the system. Okay, so basically that would be way, 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 way downstream. For example, Amazon. You know Amazon and their one-click thing. Yeah. Well, guess what happens when one-click happens? You know, your your <laughs> your ship. You've been invoiced. You've got suggestions. You. you <laughs> Man, you're, you're, uh, this is where they put their money, you know, on where throughput is generated. But let's say for you and I, okay, uh, we're in a company and this is where investments that are costly must ideally find their way to the constraint. Like, for example, let's say see here and test. We need toys and we need sophisticated toys because we're in a like canary uh, deployment solution of uh, with. 20 countries and five cities and different cultures. So C will have very, very expensive toys. Okay. Mm. So I don't want C to be a non-constraint so that it has a, a, a excessive capacity. So I want C to be as limited as possible. And this way, A, B, and D, they're not the places where they're going to have to have uh, excess capacity that uh, requires a lot of investments okay so when you require a lot of investment it's a place to have a capacity where you would like to minimize this massive amount of investments and have the non-constraint have plenty of capacity to be able to feed you yeah okay so throughput accounting tells you where you want to have your constraint you can have it not in a place where it's operationally complex you definitely want to have it on a place where you generate throughput. And if it's something very, very expensive, you want the constraint to be located there. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> now, following up on focus on idle work and not idle worker, and I think really, because we all know the sentence, eh, John, it, mm. it's a classic. Mm. Okay. But in high performing organization, people, and I'm reading the quote, people waiting for work as opposed to work waiting for people. Okay, so this is a quote from uh, Steve and I, but it is a, it's, it's, it's false, okay? Just in this context, when you are at the constraint, it's not a place to be idle as a worker. You have got to work. Yeah. Because the minute lost on the constraint is a minute lost on the bottom, it's a dollar lost on the bottom line. So this yeah. sentence, they're focused on idle work, not idle worker. Well, when you're at the constraint, you don't want your workers not to be busy, to be on a slack mode. You know, they got to work, they got to work, and they yeah. got to uh, have big, big batches of work, although Agile will say, you know, go with small batches. Yeah, that's true anywhere else but the constraint. But at the constraint, you want big batch. And... Uh, Agile says you should always work sequentially, you know. Yes, but not at the constraint. At the constraint, if you got a schedule, if you got to make plans, that you got to uh, do parallelism, it's totally acceptable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, in terms of knowledge work, so I see I see the lorry there, and I get it. But can you give me an example for knowledge work where you'd want that batch to be big? Uh, are you talking about like maybe if it was software, like a uh, some okay. massive release or something like that. is that what you mean or okay okay then because though this <clears throat> this ties to the economic order quantity you know you know eoq yeah oh yeah eoq what does it say order big batch okay yeah yeah and everybody that's everywhere really likes big batches because they reduce the cost down but Reducing the cost down is good at only one place in the theory of constraint is where the constraint is. 
because the other people don't have to worry about that because they have plenty of slack anyway. Whether they do a big batch is like a setup cost, you know? So, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah so let's, yeah. let's take, for example, these guys. Let's say A, a does 20 setup costs a week, B uh, does 50. Every time people will say, hey, setup cost costs money. And the answer yeah. is no, it doesn't because they're not the constraint. They got plenty of slack. They can pay can I, as much as can they I, want. Can I, can I pause you there? So yeah. basically, I think what you're saying is we don't worry so much about transaction cost at the constraint because, uh, you know, basically you want the constraint to be fully utilized. Yes. And okay. whatever it takes to make that. Is that, is that a, another way of putting it? Or would you think it's a bit uh, inaccurate? Well, okay. 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 Uh, yes. The constraint must be kept busy and yeah. cost is not an object. Yeah. Okay, I'll let me put it this way because I, I don't think we reach one another with the, the way you, 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 you just labeled this. But okay. at, at the analysis, dev and new AT point, you've got plenty of slack. So just do as much transaction cost as you want and coordination cost as you want because anyway, it won't matter. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but I, I admit that sometimes when I talk about these things, it's, it's, it's yeah. my mind gets, uh, my brain gets stuck on a, on a few beats too. So basically, when you're at the constraint, you got to work, and uh, incurring costs at the constraint, of course, mm. are significant because a setup cost that is not at the constraint basically has no cost. That's a bit tricky. Mm. So, on the constraint, you have to be in a non-stop work yeah. mode. Yeah. If you've got to do a ton of transaction costs, if there's a ton of coordination costs, well, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of people in the Agile world uh, would say utilization is bad. It can be bad, but in, on the constraint, you want to be bloody utilized. <laughs> That's the whole idea. <laughs> unless, yeah, yeah. unless you don't want money to make money and unless you don't want to produce. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay? Yeah. So this is a flawed mantle model. It's probably the worst anti-pattern. And everybody does it. You know, like nobody, nobody is capacity savvy. No one. Creating slack by decreasing whip is a dangerous proposition. Uh, and the quote there again from Steve Tendon and myself, slack of or idleness is a necessary condition for high organizational performance. Now, this is really interesting because I, when I was young, well, not, not that young ago, Tom DeMarco published a book and it was called Slack. Mm -hmm. And he gave this little game that you have to play digitally, you know, with your fingers, you know, it, it's not like a, an iPhone game. So you have mm -hmm. this little square there with numbers and you got only one slot free and you got to go from one to eight and you got to change the numbers and occupy the space. It's really hard. Okay. Like mm -hmm. really hard. Whoops. But then you take up two, two spaces. And you go yeah. from one to seven. It's really easy. It's easier. Let's say it's easier. It still take a, a while, but it's easier. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take three squares up, like it's child's play. Yeah. And this is the example at the time that Tom DeMarco gave as to how reducing whip creates slack. And yeah. then he went on about all of the benefits of slacks, without, which I will spare you because they are there. And we know all them, and we know them. So we, we always talk about them. Yeah. But now, what Tom DeMarco says is, hey, come on, guys, you want Slack, just reduce Swift. But in light of what we have talked in the previous sections, capacity exists, and we're not capacity savvy. So why he says, you know, that, A, hey, Reduce work and process, and uh, so is the impact on Slack. And uh, uh, you know, like he has a adverse yeah, yeah. yeah. relationship yeah. with Slack, right? Yeah. And that's what he says. Well, no, because let's see what's going to happen when you don't have protective capacity and you reduce with. Okay, let's see what happens if it's fun. 
Well, the step, and you know, this is a bit of a story, made up story. The step one, your accountants and your company, they, they rule the company. They're going to cut protective capacity and excess capacity as it is deemed waste. Yeah, because they're lazy. <laughs> Short term benefits are going to increase. Bonus is around the corner. The accountant will get a promotion. And that's what he's done. Eh? He's got protective capacity and excess capacity because it's money in the bank right away. Mm -hmm. And down the months, down a few months, let's see what's going to happen in, in, in five minutes, talking in five minutes here. You don't have excess capacity or protective capacity. So to protect the constraint, you need whip. You kind of have whip in front of the constraint to protect it. Yeah, that's where you need a buffer yeah, to yeah. make it high, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So yeah. over time, we'll skyrocket so that the constraint will be kept busy. Now, I don't have capacity, so what am I going to do to protect the constraint to put inventory? Well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go like crazy. I'm going to work 24 hours a day because I don't have that excess capacity. That makes it easy for me to generate with. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so inventory, uh, so you see A and B, I cut off my, my excess capacity here. Yeah. Right? So I got no more. So I can't just say, hey, I need inventory. Oh, push the easy button and inventory will build. Now I don't have the capacity, so I'm going to have to sweat it out, to work hard, to create a lot of whip here. You know, like if this is a train yeah. container, a cargo train. So yeah. I'm going to put, I'm going to have to sweat it out with no capacity to work like crazy to create that whip which theoretically could go to infinity, okay? There's no limit to how much whip you can need to protect the constraint when you have no excess capacity. So delivery time will go up, cost will go up, whip will increase. Slack will totally disappear now. There'll be no more Slack. Hey, you reduce the capacity, you have no more, you have no more Slack. You can't reduce whip. Whip is gonna go through the roof. <clears throat> And protective capacity will have to be purchased. So if you are in an environment where you don't have enough protective capacity and excess capacity, do not think uh, that reducing uh, whip uh, will uh, give you more slack because you won't be able to reduce whip, is my message to you. Got it. Okay. One, one of my, odd, yeah. Just curious uh, for anyone watching as well, if anyone has any questions, please ping a message just like Andrew did earlier on, and we'd be delighted to shout out your question. Thank you. Go yeah. ahead, uh, Daniel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, John, again for, for having me. But these, these are topics that I like because they're off the beaten path, you know, and nobody mm. tackles them. Mm. And I think they should be tackled. Yeah. Uh, my all-time favorite quote here on the right, and I must say, I must say, it is my all-time favorite. <laughs> it's not enough to do your best. You have to know what to do and then do your best. It reminds me of uh, one of my uncles who died and he said so to one of his sales guys, sales guy said, but I'm doing my best. And then my uncle said, that's what worries me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, <laughs> to, to each his own, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, the odd couple, wait time and touch time. Everybody knows what wait time, touch time is, you know? Mm. But there is a science between wait time and touch time. And it's an odd couple. And I will be calling on you, uh, John, to give me a quick answer, you know, like within two seconds, uh, just for the heck of it. It's going to be a chicken and egg problem, okay? Warn you, okay. I'm going to ask you which one comes first, wait time or touch time, okay? Okay. And you got to answer, so prepare yourself. Okay. <clears throat> so, wait time and touch time. Uh, they, 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 there's something of uh, that has to be tightly coupled. Uh, some people use like Tameflow. We use wait time at the entry point of a process. You know, like in development, we're in a wait yeah. state, and you wait in a wait yeah. state. Well, with Kanban, when you enter a system, you're in touch time. You're in touch time. And then you're done. You're in a wait state. Okay. So my question to you is, uh, John, and did you see the chicken and egg problem there? I'm just yeah. asking you. You know, which comes first, <laughs> wait time or touch time? Um, I have a personal preference for wait time first and then touch time. 
Okay. Uh, some people prefer to show the in progress and then the done column because yeah. that shows as a pull for the next, but I have a preference for visualizing cues rather than visualizing done work. Yeah, you're, you're a less person, eh? Yeah. Yeah, that's why. Because because less has this uh, this thing. Okay, so that that's good. That's good. That's good. So let's take on the top here a TensorFlow board, and I got my UAT. I got my UAT, and I want to do my flow efficiency within my UAT. Flow efficiency requires calculations of wait time and touch time for UAT. And look at that. I got my wait time and my touch time for UAT. Waiting for and in process. This is a TensorFlow flow efficiency board. Yeah. Hey, it works. Now, if I go onto a Kanban board and I got my UAT and I want to know my flow efficiency for UAT, well, which requires flow efficiency also requires that you have full span of control, which I have in uh, in UAT because my flow efficiency calculation is in UAT with the wait time and touch time pertaining to UAT being part of UAT. Mm -hmm. When I'm in UAT with a Kanban board. Well, my touch time, the doing of UAT really belongs to, to UAT. Yeah. But the done time of development belongs to UAT, but UAT has no control over it. It's just like being parked there. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the meter goes up in development team on my back of UAT. So I don't have a full span of control and I don't have uh well I, I sort of have issues yeah okay, now let's take a flow efficiency kanban board for those who would like to make a mapping with the cfd which everybody knows in kanban how they work if i have a uat and i got my winning for and end process and my uat on the cfd matches with the pink the dark pink yeah well, I got 100% span of control, so my span, my flow efficiency calculation is really, really cool. But if I do again my UAT on the CFD, my UAT is the doing part of UAT and the done time of development for which, you know, stuff is just parked there without my knowing what should come first or not. Yeah. It's time that is accumulated on my back without me having a span of control on it so it doesn't work as well yeah the only thing is um i saw daniel vicanti on a drunk agile episode and he was kind of giving out about flow efficiency because he's saying it's not very actionable uh but ah. we'll talk about that another day because <laughs> if it's like 45 percent, if it's 25 percent, like what do i do you know okay uh, so now now, well, I don't want to. It's another topic, another day. I, I'll maybe. let yeah. I'll let Daniel yeah. uh, be, 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 because he's he's very 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 smart. But the the thing is that we use uh, his tools to, to to solve the problem. So that will be for another time because Daniel is. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've got lots to talk about. Really, yeah. really respect. Yeah. yeah. I, I, enough, because uh, Daniel is really a fantastic guy. I, 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 yeah, okay. Span of control versus sphere of influence. Why postponing commitment is counterintuitive? Well, it's pretty, uh, this is a short uh, section as well as that. Span of control is that part of reality over which you have complete power to change anything. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're in full time, for example, you're in, you have span of control. And sphere of influence is that further part of reality over which you don't have some kind of influence. Now, postponing commitment, uh, you've got the choice. Eh? If you have the, uh, the, the tools and you have the, uh, the capacity and your clients just have stuff and stuff and stuff to do, well, the reflex is, hey, I have the tools, I own the tools, I build the tools, I have span of control, I'm just going to increase capacity. It's going to cost me a lot of money. It's going to cost a lot of time. And, but so be it. I'm, I, I have my span of control. I decide without needing help from anyone. Mm -hmm. But we've all seen that postponing commitment without in, having the need to increase capacity is the, is the smartest way to go. But then you've got to go play under your sphere of influence. Tell your client, hey, why don't you wait? 
uh, defer commitment, uh, uh, exercise your options. Uh, you, you see, so this is why uh, those who are not agile struggle with the excessive amount of work and process uh, and you know, think things that never work because the system is cluttered. And so, and so are you saying that a lot of people are just focusing on the span of control, and what they should be doing is looking further upstream and downstream? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That ties in with my thinking as well. Okay. Yeah, that, that that would be a good example as well. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I like the upstream downstream stuff. I never made the uh, the connection. Thank you for that, John. Okay. And the other C words, you know, like you've got, because we've talked about uh, the capacity, which would be the first C word. And the other C yeah. words are constraints. You know, we've got a, a metaphor, uh, the Jeep, the jungle, and the journey. And I want to, uh, to look at the quote here uh, mm -hmm. by Goldratz, good hearts law. When a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. But everything that we see and that we'll discuss today, they're not target measures. They are measures that can be observed. And once you see them, you adjust. But they're never a target measure. The thing that is toxic with target measures is that if you don't meet them, there's going to be a variance. And if the variance is favorable or unfavorable, they'll be finger pointing, oh, that was your objective. You didn't meet it, oh, you met it, oh, fantastic. But when you have measures, like in Kanban, flow metrics, and stuff like that, where you can observe and improve yourself, then there's no variance analysis. And variance analysis comes from target metrics, which are really, really bad for the health of your company and for your personal health, because you're always chasing this. When it should be trends, not targets. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. It should be targets. trends, not targets. Yeah. 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 So we have here constraints because I've seen you uh, at the beginning, uh, John, the constraint and the work process, but there are also uh, constraints and the workflow and the work execution. Yes. Right. So constraint and the workflow is the business domain. It's the workload that arrives randomly at a team, and yeah. it's full of surprises. The Jeep is the way we, we work around it. That's the way we do things here. Okay, it's our skills, our tools, our processes. Yeah. And the jungle is basically once you start the work execution, how we yeah. handle our tools, how we understand the business domain, and stuff happens and it's full of, of you know, hazards. And let's see how it goes, because I'm going to make a small illustration, because it is important for, for, for people to know where are the constraints and knowledge work, okay? So the constraint is the, the journey that we have, it's the workflow. Let's say, <coughs> let's say you have team A, which is in, in the big, what color is that, green square? Mm -hmm. And the other one, which is in the bluish square, and you see that there's a lot of work in the bluish square, right? There's a ton of work. And in the green square, there's not so many tickets. There's one, two, three, five. Which one do you think is a constraint in the workflow? The team that is a constraint in the workflow. Well, it's the blue screen, uh, the blue square, right? Because it's the one most affected by work. It's hard for me to tell which one is the constraint, really, to be honest. Okay. Um, Team, yeah. team A is green. Okay, yeah, it's a big square. Yeah. okay. Team Team A yeah. is the big green square. Okay. Yeah, I got that. Yeah. And it has one, two, three, four, five, six work items. Yeah. Uh, five. Yeah. And team blue is a team and it has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It's got yeah. eleven items coming its way. Which one is overburdened? Which one is a constraint and workflow? It's the team that has the highest work distribution coming toward it. So it will be team blue. Okay. Uh, I'm at you now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a bit cold. And it's not something. Yeah. Oh. 
And knowing that Team Blue is the constraint and the workflow, we look at the work process of Team Blue, of Team Blue and we see that development is the step and the work process that's, that takes the highest amount of time, three days and on average to go through development instead of analysis, which could be one day and tests, which could be two days. So we see that a constraint and the work process of Team Blue is development. So we know where the constraint is and we can be aware as to how to manage its system. Okay. By the way, I like the, the way you've done cycle time or the flow time distribution on top of the columns. Yeah. Their distributions, right? That's nice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Their yeah. their uh, flow time distribution. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and we see that development is the one that is the constraint and the work process. Yeah. And then the work execution. Well, the CCPM buffer of Team A for that you know process uh, for that uh, project, whatever. Well, we see that the execution is running into the red. Yeah, so it, it could, could be start, running so. into yellow or green, but it's just yeah. to show you that our project plan uh, is is in that area. And yesterday, I saw that you had a talk on how to manage project and project plans uh, with uh, yeah. with Kanban, and yeah. uh, we have uh, interesting tools and twists uh, regarding that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, topic uh, part two. Are we doing on time? Are we good? Uh, nice we're, we're, we're a bit over time, but it's okay. You can keep going. It's, okay, uh, it's yeah, it's what, but we're 47 minutes in now. Okay. Uh, anyway, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I got stuff. Uh, I got thinking of more stuff in it even. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the quote, the quote here that I have is of course one of mine in 2020. It deals with uh, actual accounting and uh, time flow with time flow accounting and throughput accounting. Uh, because when we talk of uh, target uh, metrics and target objectives and variance analysis, well, year in, year out, cost accounting reflects reality in only three unlikely scenarios. When the actuals meets budgets, there's no variance. You have nothing to fight about. Yeah. If you buy and sell products at a markup without adding value, mm -hmm. if you're in a distributorship type of business model, and when there are no changes in inventory levels. So whenever you're caught in a cost accounting system where you're being measured, you will always get into fights unless these three very unlikely conditions occur, which means that's why cost accounting is such a bad system. It's uh, anti-agile uh, to... Uh... Great. Uh, can I just pause you for a moment, Daniel, because we've got a question from Jersey uh, from the Tempo community, and he's also involved yeah. in uh, we're pro camp by one of the translations. Thank you, Jersey, for your question. Uh, so what in a situation when Team Blue has 10 people and Team A has two people, is Team B still a constraint? Okay. Uh, we're, we're in a float dilemma, you know, <clears throat> whether Team A has a gazillion people and Team B has three people and they go interchangeably. We observe flow data. We don't care about people and who's behind each thing we observe flow data mm. andre is agreeing with you okay thank you andre thank you jersey okay P uh, please go on um daniel thank you yeah that 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 you know that when we had the book reviewed <coughs> we had a, a we had a, a few accountants you know and, and uh, anyway and they're always asking that question and we said repeatedly and repeatedly what i just given you now and it was it was funny you know because that was a bit of a resistance you know how can you account for these things that's flow data man you just look at it yeah but how many people work there and there so we don't care <laughs> <laughs> that went over like a lead balloon <laughs> oh man <laughs> it uh it uh it, it got into some really really heated exchange but at some point you know Okay, mm. Let, let's forge. Let's forge ahead. Then. But thank you for that question. It, it uh, uh, wow, uh, Jersey. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Andrew, and Andrew as well for supporting you. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, 
Thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, this unanimity this is based decision making with and my little quote of there is enemies at the gate okay here we have things flowing from left to right yeah okay and i got a capacity of four right in the middle and i got a capacity yeah. of six at left capacity of six uh, upstream and downstream in both cases and my throughput is dictated by the place where it has the least, lowest amount the the least yeah. capacity, which is capacity at four. Do we agree on that? Yes, we do. Are you sure? I think yes. so. Yeah. Yes, is yes, that yes, a yes, trick yes. question? <laughs> uh, yeah, because I, I, I just want to drill this yeah. so that people on the next slide understand my point. Now, listen, if you know that your constraint is at C, there's no need for consensus voting. Okay. If you got somebody like, for example, uh, your chief engineer, super architect that says, you know, in a meeting, oh, we're going to go and fix a problem on uh, on 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 uh, on uh, A. A is not the constraint. It's going to cost a lot of money. And then people are going to have to vote consensus, you know. But everybody knows the constraint is at C. Well, if they don't, they can vote and without no doubt the big architect is going to win but now when you know where the constraint is it's kind of uh, uh, odd to suggest things that are not really affecting the constraint you, you lose waste time in discussion you lose waste time and trying to build consensus and you can reach what we call unanimity based decision making hey look at all the solutions we have well which ones these with the constraint oh this one okay let's go End of meeting. Yeah, you see my point? I do, yeah. Okay. So this is something also, I'm not saying decision-based consensus making is not needed. I'm not saying that. And tons of places it's needed. But when you come to your way that you work and to your flow uh, system, your work processes, if you are constraint savvy and you know the constraint is at sea, Everybody that has a nice suggestion on D, B, and A, well, wait your turn on turn until such time as you are the constraint. In the meantime, you've really got to pull together and sustain C. If not, you will only increase cost. You will increase cost, and you will increase cost in a permanent manner forever, okay. which is not something that you would like to do. So basically, it becomes like obvious, or I'm not sure yeah. the word is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> but when you don't know that, you vote. You know, you mm -hmm. vote. So, what what makes the more sense? You know, keep going there, Daniel. I'm just going to change my lighting here. The sun is shining in a bit too strong on me. Okay, okay. Well, am I doing okay? You're doing great. Thank you. Keep okay. going there. Now, time boxing and inherent simplicity. Uh, it's basically the agile recipe of blending oil with water. And I'll, I'll, from one angle, I'm not saying that time boxing is not good. I'm just saying that there is one part of Dr. Eli's goal rat which deals with inherent simplicity, which contradicts uh, time boxing. Okay, and I'll go there right away. Uh, uh, degrees of freedom. Do, do you remember the, the, what degrees of freedoms are, uh, John? We learned that like way, way when we were really young, like I think 15 years old. But I'll refresh your mind. Degrees yeah, of freedom. Huh? For the audience, would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Degrees of freedom. Uh, I got two equations here with uh, four, five components on the right of X. Okay. In equation one, I got 40 plus 10 minus 30 plus 20, and I got x. It's going to equal to 100. So x must be equal to 60. Then I have my other equation with five components, 50 plus 95 plus x, x. x must equal 125. And both equations, I have, although I have five components on the left of 100, I only have four degrees of freedom because I can have any four first variable value in the world, in the universe, doesn't matter. But the fifth one has to make it so that it fits to 100. Uh -huh. So we have one degree of freedom 
on an equation that has five components. Got it. <coughs> now, let me ask you, uh, which, is, which system is simpler? The one on the left or the one on the right? <coughs> the, the one on the right looks more straightforward because it has some kind of process flow yeah, the steps yeah, that yeah. it goes through yeah yeah is that right though because the, the one on yeah, the left which system uh, are you saying again because i can't hear you the one on the right seems more straightforward because yes. it's clear what steps the work goes through whereas yes. the one on the left i have no idea what the interaction is or yes. how much interaction there is yeah. yes the yeah. one on the left has five degrees of freedom you gotta have make five actions to make it mm. work the one on the right you just press a button and everything boom is interconnected so when yeah. people say hey i've got a lot of interdependencies well it's not a bad thing because you know how they're going to in, they're going to behave not a hundred percent but you know that you have lesser amount of freedom in that case now this is where i'm getting to and the world where we uh, where we live and uh, walk and swim and jump as a human being i have six degrees of freedom you know i can roll i can big back flip i can go on the left i can go on the right i can jump so as a human being i got six degrees of freedom in space time time has only one degree of freedom time cannot go back time cannot go sideways it can only go one way ahead yeah. and time has birth for <coughs> one degree of freedom now let's see scope scope here is my book the table of content on, on all uh, mm -hmm. 10 pages now how many are three degrees of freedom do you think there is in there like the yeah. linearization the dependencies the development yeah. cross references yeah I mean, there is a lot, okay? Yeah. So basically, the entertain flow approach, we manage to the time axis rather than the scope axis. The time dimension only unrolls in one direction, from the past to the future. And what is gone is gone. And this is one example of inherent simplicity that instead of working on scope and you work through time, with lesser degrees of freedom, we gain in simplicity, as Dr. Goldratt talked about. This. So th th this is really nice. I love this part, and it, and it a bit, and this 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 by the way was was brought by Steve Tenden <laughs> when we were writing the book, and I just went gaga over this. I I just love it. The new kid in town. <clears throat> dependency management dependency management i see some i see uh, uh, the, the smartest people uh, doing work on dependency management they know who they are uh, i am not going to name them but they're very smart yeah. and all of they do all of they do is write on the money and it is needed but in a Dependency management and a theory of constraint work is cool. What they do is great, but the theory of constraint controls variation by subordinating all the interdependencies to the constraint of the system and then managing according to the performance of the constraints via work execution signal. It means that if you found a dependencies and you find a way to fix it, because they do find they do offer solutions that are really brilliant but if it doesn't affect the constraint uh, this is what we're saying you know like uh, just be aware be, be be constraint savvy well you understand my point there uh, john i do yeah yeah you know like for example well i i won't dwell into it because that their work is is wow way above my pay grade they're really smart people uh, but to which I say, uh, if, if you don't take into consideration the constraint, you will basically just add layers and layers and layers of overhead costs that will remain there permanently. Because when you make an improvement 
and you put it somewhere, well, every month you're going to have to sustain that improvement through operational expenses and you're just spending money for nothing. Yeah. Column whip limits. <coughs> yeah. As a form of tampering with the system and spawning special cause variation signals on top of special cause variation signals, thinking that they are linked to common cause variation. Okay. So let's take, it's going to be a bit uh, long and, uh, but it's, it's a bit tricky to follow this one. So here, John, we have a Kanban board, traditional Kanban board with whip limits. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You agree with me? Yeah. What's the first thing I see? Wow. I see starvation and I see a bottleneck. Yeah. You agree with me? Yeah. So what? does traditional Kanban tell you to do is that traditional Kanban is based on event risk driven management. You see sign, you see something and you act on it and you see something on the board and you act on it. So there, there could be <coughs> the team stops and discusses and fixes things. Okay. Yeah. And event driven risk management, obviously is who can pull the cord. Well, anybody can pull the cord. <clears throat> as soon as risks become visible and materializes itself on the board. And you pull the end on cord, you know, because uh, you know what the end on cord is, eh? When uh, you're in. Yeah, and try to stop the factory. But do you mean yeah. on, a, on a Kanban board, you mean blocking the card? Is that what you mean? No. How would you visualize that? Yeah, yeah. That, well, that's the thing, you know? Yeah. When you see a sign and you see that you should stop, well, you basically pull the end on, you know, hey, guys, stop got something here yeah oh yeah because yeah. blocked they could ignore the block yeah, so yeah, it, yeah. It, it's yeah. a bit similar to pulling the end on because when you pull the end on things stop no matter who you are what you are right yeah. so it, it's a bit of an analogy it's a bit you know anyway so mm. now we're back to our two problems which are circle and red yeah and it seems that here we're okay you know we have no problem there. Our, our problems are mainly centered here. Here we seem to be okay. Now what I have done is I have done a flow. I, can, I have transmuted a Kanban board with whip limits and the doing done, doing done, doing done columns to a flow efficiency Kanban board with waiting for and process, waiting for and process, waiting for and process. And our two circles are basically, you know, shifted to the right. But they're still there. Our visual clues are still there. But now I see that I got with the circle of stars there in development. I got one ticket and process. And with a circle of suns, I have full kitting there because they seem to be, you know, I don't know if that's a signal or, 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 or noise. I have no clue. But let me tell you something. When I pull my capacity matrix in my average flow time metrics i have an issue there because i'm about to run out of work and a constraint and i'm gonna starve it's not a nice place to be i want people in full kitting to you know get me something out i have no issue with starvation and bottleneck downstreams they're a mirage yeah there should not be a cause of concern. Yeah, that's interesting. So the natural tendency is to swarm on the merge and master when yeah. the actual problem in this case is in development. Yeah, because the average flow time of demo and merge on master, yeah. I mean, okay. And and, 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 and traditional Kanban, uh, uh, walk through you will go from right to left and never come to see what's on the on the far left but if you use for example daniel's like anti aging that that little work and process and development will probably uh would probably show <laughs> yeah yeah so basically if you if in other words if a team is using the uh um, work uh, aged work in progress chart that's an actionable agile or tools like Campbellize at the 
where action badge is already included, if you spot the things that are in the red or the yellow, is that what you're, is that where you're going? That you're looking for the aging for that column? I'm saying that aging tool of Daniel McIntyre never hurts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Never hurts. But on top and above is that this is on top of the food chain. Okay. If if you were to have plenty of red tickets uh, on the far right, okay, like mm -hmm. uh, Daniel Vacanti uh, uh, would show, okay, it's something to take into account, but they may not, they may all be uh, uh, green. <clears throat> the thing is, on top and above of what Daniel Vacanti can give, you need to consider where the constraint is in the workflow. And so this need, where yeah. the sweet yeah. spot is. So I liked your board earlier. So if you had a flow time distribution on each column, you'd see that. A lot of tools don't show that, right? You'd have to yeah. kind of do some analysis to check where, where that is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, being aware of your constraint mm -hmm. uh, will make you decide, you know, hey, what's ever on the far right side, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I, I got to focus on the far left because I am about to start the constraint. And if I start the constraint, I'm losing money. Yeah. So if I rush, if I swarm, I'd much rather go to development than uh, merge on master or whatever, uh, because this is not where the money is. Okay, so no matter what you do, uh, average flow time, uh, and, and I know that the, 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 um, Daniel adds uh, things about all oh, flow efficiency is hard to calculate, but when you use your tool and you get these metrics down in a nanosecond, it doesn't come so hard to calculate. Yeah, that wasn't his issue. His issue was how actionable is it? So if you're We'll do it on yes. another show, right? It's in our topic. No, yeah. no yeah. I feel I feel like answering yeah. it uh, uh, right now yeah. because <clears throat> what most people do is that they 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 freak they freak they freak on the flow efficiency metric, okay? And Daniel, what he says about the flow efficiency metric is absolutely right, but flow efficiency is an economic model. It's a business. It's a it's a, a business decision model. If you understand the component between wait time and touch time and wait time and touch time as to when you should put things in wait time and as to when you should put things in touch time, you are going to make a lot more money than if you just concentrate on the flu efficiency metric. Okay? Because flu efficiency being considered as a economic model is never heard of, is never spoken of as. I'm going to leave it for another day, if you don't mind, Daniel. We're way over time, and you've got more stuff to cover. So oh, I have one thing. I have one thing, yeah. and we're done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, column width limits, uh, they are bad for you. Uh, they foster improvement by happenstance, local optimization, artificial bottlenecks, loss of focus. There's a lot of details in Steve Stanton's books. And that's it. We're going to stop here, OK? Cool. So. Um... Looking for comments, questions from the audience. Any any questions from anybody about the flawed mental models that uh, Daniel has brought up today? And um, Daniel, um, just in terms of uh, while we're waiting for people to to comment, I uh, just want to make people aware of some offers. Okay, so um, the the book, for example. Uh, it's available. The Tame Your Workflow book is available uh, at this yeah. URL, tameflow.com. Get your workflow book. There's also a discount offer. Um, so uh, if you use this particular link, I'll share these links uh, on the uh, on the YouTube version of the video. It's on, on a number of channels, but I'll save it in the comments there. Um, and also, there's uh, there's Tameflow training as well from Daniel yes. and from other. Tameflow trainers. So you go to tameflow.com yes. and then for slash Tameflow hyphen training. So yes, uh, well worth checking it out. Uh, really very interesting. The book is uh, is really, really good. Really enjoyed it. Uh, it's Tame Your Workflow. 
uh, by Daniel Dwaran and uh, Steve Tendon. I uh, really enjoyed uh, reading it. And we've had Steve on the show a few times and Daniel has been on a few two times. There's a lot of depth and breadth to this body of knowledge. Um, so some people dismiss theory of constraints. Don't dismiss it so quickly. I actually have found situations where uh, it was needed. Um, and uh, yeah, so don't be too quick to dismiss it. It's not like on or off. It's far more black, uh, far more, uh, it's not black and white. It's kind of shades and uh, that kind of thing. So there are definitely situations where I've seen that it, it was uh, applicable. And uh, oh, there's varying opinions on that. Of course, some people say it's always applicable, but uh, that's a debate for uh, another session. Um, but I found it very, very valuable. And uh, I hope uh, that you're enjoying the show. So we do have a question from Jersey. Um, and so uh, what could you advise on what to do in the situation of changing constraint in the workflow and or in the work process due to whatever reason? Okay. When, when you change the constraint from A to B, uh, you have got to be conscious that you have to maintain uh, dynamic stability, okay? So you want the constraint to remain always at the same place. Now, as to where you choose your constraint to be, well, throughput accounting gives the example whether uh, you want to, load, uh, to uh, influence the constraint in terms of it, the throughput it can generate, in terms of the complexity, operating complexity, or in terms of the investments that are required to maintain the constraint in place. And with that knowing, remember that if you have a constraint at one place, all of the other places have to have excess capacity. And that's uh, that's basically the key. Thank you. There's, there's a Thank you. There's a follow-up question as well. Jersey, let us know if we answer that one properly. But Jersey has another question. Um, so which uh, of those flawed mental models you would start to talk with the CEO of the company to explain with him uh, and why? And, and why mental models? Uh, well, basically, they have to be addressed in either, you know, anti-patterns, cognitive biases. But, and again, I always come to uh, Patrick Staggart's uh, words of wisdom, you know, you can work for six months trying to show them and explain them, or you can have them go through a nice simulation like Okaloa Flow Lab of Patrick Steyert and have them understand within a day and now they feel it, they say. And I don't quite understand it, but I, I dig it. Instead of going through a six month long period of working on the job and finally they get it. Complexity can be live in a simulation, a good simulation. Thank you. Um... I just have a, a question about the uh, the training, uh, Daniel. Yes. So uh, the training is available on your website and uh, tameflow.com. Um, so you've been running this online and um, just curious, like what simulations you've been using to simulate uh, Tameflow basically um, in your training sessions? Are you using Twig or are you using some other kind of uh, Kanban simulation? Well. We are developing, uh, as you know, simulations of our own. Uh, every trainer is basically free to use uh, what uh, he or she likes. Mm -hmm. But uh, I am uh, I, I have a sweet spot, and uh, and a lot of uh, the trainers also uh, uh, in the Tameflow community have a sweet spot spot for uh, <coughs> Patrick Steyer's uh, Okaido Waffle Lab uh, simulation, which I think is uh, by far uh, the most uh, brilliant. And it's now on online, uh, virtual, online, whatever. Yeah, I, 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 yeah I, for me, it's fantastic. And uh, have you used the online version of Patrick Steyer's simulation? Yes, yes. but okay. not, no, no, yes. Okay. But you have to be uh, some uh, certified or uh, yeah, yeah. something. But I have people that are certified that do that part of the class for me. Uh, I see. Although yeah, I've okay. been running Okaloa Flow Lab for ages on the cardboard version, on the physical board version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Okay, I didn't realize there were those restrictions. Okay, thank you for. Well, for, for online, yes, you've got to be certified by Patrick. He has a, a threshold of quality. He has a great brand, and uh, but if you have the board version, you know anybody can use can use it. It's, when COVID stops, um, I'll probably go back to using the the board version, which I mastered very well and which I enjoy giving. Okay. All right. Um, there are no more questions coming in, so I think we're done for today. I'll just give people one last shout to uh, have last questions or comments um, before we wrap up for today. Uh, just be while we're waiting. Uh, I do. I was showing people I have a little toy. I've got this new little toy, little clock. It's uh, counts my youtube followers and instagram and twitter and all that kind of stuff and uh if you follow or subscribe it rings my bell here so it kind of makes my that part of my day so uh i have to give me some little bit of fun in life so if you feel like ringing my bell uh maybe you could just uh, uh follow me on those i'd really uh really appreciate that um so daniel i'm not seeing any more comments or questions so i think we'll uh, call it a day okay uh, well, thank you very much for coming on the show Okay, I hope you enjoyed it. It was a bit uh, off the beaten path, but uh, it was nice. I liked it. You got a lot done in an hour and a quarter, really did. And yes. uh, just a comment from Jersey as well saying thanks a lot. And thank you, Jersey, as well for following. Appreciate that. And uh, PR, ring the bell. PR saying ring the bell. So I don't hear ringing yet, guys, but uh, it'd be a bit of fun if it did ring. But anyway, I think we're out of time. But uh, you can always ring it later. Make my afternoon. <laughs> thank you, Pierre. So, Jack, uh, John, I am in your debts, and I thank you again for having me over. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. I love, uh, I love your work and Steve's work, and uh, I love uh, supporting what you do. And uh, I like to like other people to understand it as well. And uh, I hope I'm doing a service for people to, you know, if I can understand it, maybe everybody can understand it. So that's the that's what I do. I try to help people understand. Uh, yeah work from leading light so thank you so much for for this brilliant yeah. piece of work and, and we are off the beaten path and we like it yeah exactly brilliant thank you so much we'll call it there then and uh over and out everyone thank you very much and have a lovely afternoon i'm on again at five o'clock uk with uh, ben maynard it's uh uh less measures more outcomes uh, be very very interesting i'm going to be talking about a topic uh, as well about uh, what uh, Carl Scotland called last night to skills liquidity. Uh, I took that from uh, a lady called uh, by the sermon Swettle is not coming to me right now. Um, and we're going to talk about what's another game we can play to make sure that people who are on teams and teams of teams, that they're not complicit with keeping themselves busy because I've found that people can be complicit with keeping themselves busy and uh, not at the constraint, but other parts that maybe don't need to be busy and it's causing problems so we'll i'll talk to ben about that and i'll also be talking to uh, carlin mumby as well in the next few weeks uh, a lady from agile hr haven't posted it yet but uh, there's a theme over the next few shows about how do we uh, what game do we play in an agile world how do people get promoted how do they get rewarded uh, how, do the, how does the pay rise get calculated what the, how does that all work in an agile world can we get away from being just promoted through managerial routes and through technical specialism or is there another game and that game is something i'll start i kind of hinted at that last night with carl scotland and i'll be digging into it a bit today with ben and really looking forward to digging into it with carlin mumby when she comes on the show uh, in, the, in the coming weeks okay over and out everybody and uh, thank you pr as well thanks everybody and have a lovely afternoon bye now